Can you hear me in the room? If you can hear me, can you give me a wave? Come on, will you stand up on your feet? We're going to jump into worship. We are just so excited that you joined us today, whether you are in the room or you are online. God is good. His mercy endures forever. And we're going to jump into worship in just a second. But the word says, let everything that has breath, let everything that has breath, praise the who? Praise the? Oh, no. Praise the who? Praise the? the Lord. Amen. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your presence, God, that is already in the room. We didn't have to usher it in. You are with us in the day. You are with us in the afternoon. And you are with us in the evening. You are with us when we rise and when we fall. You're with us in the valley. You're with us in the mountain. And because you're with us even in the valley, we call the valley blessed. And so we thank you for this moment. God, would you do beyond what we expect? Would you meet us in our praise? We thank you in Jesus' name and New City Church church says amen can will you lead us hallelujah come on can we clap our hands for jesus hallelujah he's so good he's so awesome we come to lift his great name today hallelujah did you come to praise his name today oh yes we're gonna lift his name high hey hallelujah can we clap our hands Everybody clap your hands. Hey. Come on in the balcony, let me see you clap. Hey. As we love on you, receive our love, receive our love. And as we shout your name. Receive our praises, receive our praises. As we love That's all we're singing. On you, on you, we're asking God to receive our love. Receive our love, receive our love. And as we shout, as we shout in your greatness.
her welcome, she ministered Psalm 150, verse 6. It declares, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. And then it goes to say it again, praise ye the Lord. All right? So this is a new song. But the Bible also declares in Psalm verse 14, sorry, chapter 149, it says, sing unto the Lord a new song. Amen. So we're going to sing unto the Lord a new song today. All right? So can we sing this together? We're going to say, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You guys gonna try that with us? All right, I see ya. Hey, hey, come on clap. Can we clap together like this? Hey, come on clap. Come on clap. Can we clap together like this? Hey, hey, let, let everything. everything. Come on, have breath. Let have breath. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on, sing. Let everything. Come on, sing. That have breath. Praise the Lord. Woo. I praise when I'm sure. I praise when I'm doubting. Woo. Hey, I praise when I'm numbered. Hey, praise when I'm surrounded. Yes, Lord, cause praise is my water. Hey, my enemies drowning. Hallelujah, and we say, as long as I'm breathing, I gotta come on. Say. praise when I feel it, and I praise when I don't, hallelujah, yeah. I praise cause I know you're still in control, hey, come on release and say, my praise is a whip, it's more than a sound, my praise is the shout that brings Jericho down, oh come on, I think you got it, and we sing this, we say, as long as I breathe, I've got to come on, say, pray. Pray.
love him? Does anyone love him? Come on, he gave us the activities of our limbs today, so that's why we're able to clap. That's why we're able to lift our voices. It's his breath inside of us, so we're using that to give it back to him. Amen? So because we have the activities of our limbs, I want us to do something corporately today. Let's lift our hands before the Father. And I want us to fix our eyes on him. He is our center. He is our focus. And we just want to declare how beautiful he is. Come on, think about how good he's been to us. Come on, we think about it. He is beautiful. What a beautiful name. Thank you, Jesus. You are the word of the beginning. One with God. hidden glory and creation now revealed in you oh Christ what a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Christ my King what a beautiful name it is nothing comes this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Come on, we see. You did it. You did it.
15 seconds. Let's lift our hands together. Come on, you call him what it is that you can identify with. Beautiful Savior. Yes. Awesome Redeemer. Your holy God, your holy, holy. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, did you enjoy that worship experience? Hallelujah. If you love Jesus and you know he's beautiful, let's put our hands together and give him reverence all over this room. Come on, let's give him reverence all over this room. Hallelujah. He's so beautiful. He's so gracious to us. Hallelujah. Well, welcome to New City. Go ahead and greet your neighbors this morning. Say hello, I love you, good to see you. You know, sometimes we just need to see a smiling face. You never know what people have gone through throughout the week. Oh, God, we thank you. Go ahead and have your seats.
My name is Brittany. And I'm Juan. And we want to welcome you to church this morning. It's our goal for everyone who joins us for Sunday worship to feel at home. So if you're new with us, come see our team at the Connect Corner after service. We would love to get to know you and answer any questions you might have about New City. And if you're joining us online, we invite you to text CONNECT to the number at the bottom of the screen, 312-313-2729. We want to reach out to welcome you and share more about all the ways you can connect with the life and community of New City. Every month we gather to worship, pray, and spend time in God's presence together as a church family. We have seen God move mightily at our monthly prayer meetings, and we encourage you to make it a priority to join in on these moments. Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. The only way to fail at prayer is to not pray. And the best way to get started is to pray alongside other believers. This month's prayer meeting is this Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. at the Lawrence Academy Center right here at the campus of North Central College. For more directions or other details, go to newcity.life and we'll see you on Wednesday. We've had an incredible summer at New City Youth. And next Sunday, we're ending the summer together with that youth after party. Get ready for an epic day through downtown Naperville with stops at the legendary Lou Maldati's for Chicago style pizza, a refreshing break at Starbucks, and then we'll spend the rest of the afternoon swimming and playing volleyball at Centennial Beach. Now that sounds like all the ingredients for an unforgettable day. Just meet us in the lobby after service next Sunday and we'll head out from there. Make sure to register at newcity.life. Every single week, God is using the ministry of New City to help people find new life in Jesus, find freedom from sin, find purpose and meaning, and find community and belonging. Last week, we got this message from Adam Bear. I recently relocated to Naperville for work and I was looking for an opportunity to build friendships in the area. Community is a necessity for everybody and New City does a great job of creating those opportunities, not just through church services and small groups, but by creating opportunities to be of service and work as part of a team. I truly don't believe I would have some of the friendships that I have now if the LED wall didn't need to be set up every week. And I'm so grateful that I can be a part of that team. Each time you give, you are directly impacting those who have yet to receive the new life, new way, and new purpose that we find in Jesus. Today, you can give in one of three ways, on our app, on the New City website, or by texting a dollar amount to the number 84321. Thank you for your faithful support and may God bless you as you give. God is speaking this morning and he has a word for you. Have an awesome Sunday, New City. Leading us on 
Sometimes we gotta rise. Sometimes we gotta fall. Sometimes we gotta lose ourselves to find our way home. Sometimes we gotta pray before we. God's word this morning. Stand up on your feet for me. Second Kings chapter four, starting from the 18th verse. When the child had grown, he went out one day to his father among the reapers, and he said to his father, "Oh my head, my head." The father said to his servant, "Carry him to his mother." And when he had lifted him up and brought him to his mother, the child sat on her lap till noon, and then he died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door behind him and went out. Then she called to her husband and said, "Send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys that I may quickly go to the man of God and come back again." And he said, "Why will you go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath." She said, "All is well." Somebody look to your neighbor and say, "All is well." Come on, that neighbor ain't want to talk to you. You look to the other neighbor and say, "Neighbor, I don't know what you're going through today, but all is well." 
Then she saddled the donkey and she said to her servant, urge the animal on, do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When the man of God saw her come and he said to Gehazi, his servant, look, there is the Shunammite. Run at once to meet her and say to her, is all well with you? Is all well with your husband? Is all well with the child? And she answered, all is well. And when she came to the mountain to the man of God, she caught hold of his feet. Gehazi came to push her away, but the man of God said, leave her alone for she is in bitter distress and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Then she said, did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say, do not deceive me? He said to Gehazi, tie up your garment and take my staff in your hand and go. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not reply. Lay my staff on the face of the child. Then the mother of the child said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead, laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was no sound or sign of life. Therefore, he returned to meet him and told them the child has not awakened. When Elijah came into the house, he saw the child lying dead on his bed. So he went in and shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he went up and laid on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, his hands on his hands, and he stretched himself upon him. The flesh of the child became warm. Then he got up again, walked once back and forth in the house and went up, stretched himself upon him again. The child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. Then he summoned Gehazi and said, call this Shunammite. So he called her and when she came to him, he said, pick up your son she, she came and fell at his feet, bowing to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. Anybody ever heard the phrase, don't get your hopes up? Anyone ever hear that by a show of hands? Someone ever tell you, you ever say it to yourself, hey, I don't want to get my hopes up? By definition, hope is the feeling of expectation or desire to see a certain thing happen. I've titled this message, Get Your Hopes Up. Let us pray. Father, allow us to have hope again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You can have a seat. You can have a seat. Shout out to Pastor Steve and Jesse. They're still on vacation and, and we love them so much. And we're so grateful that they're taking the opportunity to rest. Um, Y'all know what it is, man, going on vacation. You're like, oh, I got a couple of weeks, and then it's like tomorrow, and you're like, I'm back at work. So hopefully this has been a, a, a good, refreshing time for them. I don't know about you, but our main text this morning is kind of one of those Bible stories that, like, I, I could probably just ask the worship team to con come back up here. We could worship and then just dismiss. Just the text itself just... It encourages us already. It already begins to kind of build the faith and the hope that is our prayer this morning. But before we jump into our main text, if you've ever heard me preach before, you know that I like to highlight the context before we dig in deep into the text. Because I believe that the context is what's going to give us the power of the text that we're reading today. So there's a couple of things that we need to un unpack here. Who in the world is this Shunammite woman? And what is her connection to the prophet Elisha, the prophet of the Lord? We know there was some sort of interaction that occurred before this text because of what he says to his servant Gehazi in verse 25. He's like, look, there goes the Shunammite woman. Well, when we read a few verses before this in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 8 through 17, we don't get the Shunammite woman's identity. However, we do get some of her characteristics we see a glimpse of her heart, and we see a glimpse of her fears. To summarize, we learn a few things about this woman. She's wealthy. She's persistent. She's discerning. She is hospitable. She's lost hope, but she has a desire. 
She's wealthy. Verse 8 kicks off by describing her this way. She's persistent. We already see in verse 8 that she would urge the prophet to eat some food. So she must have been Colombian because she just wouldn't take no for an answer. <laughs> Guys, I'm Colombian. Yeah, I don't get offended. I, uh, I, know, I know I look like a white boy, pero <laughs> calmate, tranquilo, okay? Estamos bien aquí. <laughs> Mario, why you made me say that, bro? She's discerning. The Bible tells us that this prophet was coming into town and she noticed that this is a man who was being used by God. She tells her husband in verse 8, this is a holy man of God, which points to her belief in God. She's She's hospitable. She continues to tell her husband in verse 10, let us make a small room on the roof with walls and put there for him a bed, a table, a chair, a lamp. So whenever he comes to us, he can go in and stay there. So she didn't just do the bare minimum. She didn't say, hey, he could crash on the couch. He said, she said, let's build a whole room for this man. See, but we also know that she's lost hope. Elisha, the prophet of the Lord, was so moved by her hospitality that he wants to thank her and he wants to bless her. He tells his servant Gehazi to go get her and ask her what can be done for her. He was even like, hey, let her know I have a really good connection with the king. If she wants, I could put in a really good word for him, for her. But she was content. She said, I'm good. I'm among my own people. I'm I'm good. I, I don't need you to do that for me. But then the prophet persisted and asked the servant, what can we do for her? And here was Gehazi's response in verse 14. He said, well, she has no son. And he must have been from Chicago because he ain't hold back. He said, and her husband is old. Like, man, you could have said like further in life, you know what I'm saying? I want you to pay attention to this because she didn't disclose her need, but her need was obvious. The reason it was obvious was because during these biblical times, you were believed to be cursed by God if you were not able to conceive a child. So now as the reader, I'm forced to ask this question. Why in the world wouldn't this Shunammite woman ask for a child? Well, it's because of what Gehazi said. Her husband was old. In other words, with natural eyes, her situation seemed impossible, which points to her loss of hope. But I know that she has a desire for a child because pay attention to this interaction that happens in verse 16. This is the prophet speaking to her. He says, At this season, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord, O man of God, do not lie to your servant. See, that right there is a prime example of someone who doesn't want to get their hopes up. Right there in the text. But the text continues. But the woman conceived and bore a son as Elisha has said to her. Really important. Elisha is a prophet. A prophet is a person that God uses. Outside of God, the prophet has no power. As we'll see in an example of this later on. In other words, a prophet can't say, thus saith the Lord, unless the Lord thus saith it. So if Elisha is saying, by the way, let me just say, pay attention who you're listening to on YouTube, because there's a lot of prophets that be prophet lying. Make sure you're you're making sure it lines up with scripture, that you got God confirming the word and all that, because it's it's, it's crazy out there, y'all. If Elisha said, in a year you will conceive a child, it is because Elisha the prophet is discerning the Lord saying, in a year you will conceive a child. And that is an important foundational piece of truth, because here's what we have to know. When the Lord speaks, things happen. The question should never end with, what does my situation look like? Maybe that's where you start. But the question you finish with should always be, what is God saying about my situation? 
See, my situation can look like a lost cause to everyone else, but if God is saying that my situation is about to look a lot different, with all due respect, you can keep all of your opinions. I don't know about you, but I'm going to decide to hold on to what God is saying about my situation. And here's the thing. Verse 16, that interaction, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart because in her response, here's what we see. We see a woman with a desire... But it's obvious through the text that she's lost hope. The reason she's lost hope is because she's coming to a conclusion about her situation through pragmatic reasoning. She's accepted what appears to be obvious, and that's the problem. See, I find it funny that the woman who was able to discern and was able to spot the hand of God over this man's life and see how he's working in miraculous ways all through the land was unable to discern that God wanted to do something special in her own life. And the reason for that being is because it appeared to be impossible. Allow me to pitch a tent here. For a moment, I would strongly advise and encourage you pay attention to the things that appear to be impossible all around you. Pay attention to those impossible situations all around you because maybe, just maybe, that's the place that God is trying to do something special. Maybe, just maybe, it's in that impossible situation that God is trying to bring forth life. Maybe, just maybe, that's the situation that somebody that God wants to move in. I don't know who I'm speaking to this morning, but does anybody agree that there's power in the maybe? New City Church, are there a handful of people in the room? Maybe a couple dozen people in the room. Maybe a few people in the room. Matter of fact, I'll take two people. Matter of fact, no. I'll take one person in the room. Is there anyone in the room that wants to see God do the impossible again? That wants to see God bring life to dead things again? That want to see God bring life to barren things again? I don't believe you. If that's you, can you give God a shout of praise in this place? I'm trying to get you excited about this because we live in a time where hope is lost. We're living in a time where people just don't believe for things anymore and they think it's a faith issue. But the reason it's a faith issue is because the enemy got a hold of your hope first. And so we're fixated not on the supernatural God that we serve, we're fixated on the natural things that are right in front of us and it discourages us from having expectation in our lives to see God do some pretty supernatural, wonderful, amazing, miraculous, incredible things that nobody can explain kind of things in our life. And I just don't believe God wants us to live our lives that way. I believe God wants us to come in with the mindset of maybe just Maybe. The power of a maybe is that it reveals that the window of hope is still open. Imagine she had this mindset. Imagine if the conversation went differently. Elisha the prophet asks her, hey, what can be done for you? And then she begins the wrestling match in her mind. And, and the wrestling with the thoughts isn't the issue, by the way. The, the initial doubts aren't the issue. See, it, it's not the issue. The issue is when you come to your own conclusion about what God wants that isn't in line with what he actually wants. Imagine in that moment, she says to herself, because, hey, look, I got to assume a couple things here. I have to assume she tried having a child. Judging by her response in the text, this is something that was just heavy on her heart. So I have to assume that her husband and her, they probably tried having a child. They probably tried and tried and tried again. Nothing happened. Next year, they tried. They tried. They tried again. Nothing happened. Next year, they tried. They tried. And they tried again. Then nothing happened. And and maybe when nothing happened, they maybe even began to pray about it. And nothing happened. They prayed a little more maybe and nothing happened. And then the faith dwindled, the hope was lost, and then the praying stopped. See, when it didn't happen at first, I could imagine she might have still believed God for it because it still physically looked like a possibility. It wasn't until it looked like it couldn't be physically possible anymore 
that she tucked that desire away in her prayer closet deep, deep, deep somewhere, nowhere to be found. This kind of mindset what was preventing her from thinking maybe there's a chance. It was this kind of mindset that prevented her from having a glimmer of hope. But just imagine for a moment, imagine if she still held on to her maybe. She would have thought to herself in that moment, I know I've asked in the past and nothing happened, but maybe, just maybe, this is my opportunity to ask again. Because with hope, you can ask again. And that's a word for someone in the room this morning that today might just be the day that you should ask again. I don't know who I'm talking to, but maybe today, just maybe today is the day you apply for that job again. You apply for that college again. Maybe, just maybe, today's the day that child comes back home. Maybe, just maybe, today's the day that marriage could be restored. Maybe, just maybe, if you were to ask for forgiveness again, they would receive it today. Maybe, just maybe, today's the day the doctors begin to look at each other confused, asking the question, where did the cancer go? Maybe, just maybe. Come on, does anybody believe that in the room? Maybe, just maybe. Maybe. Maybe God wants to move supernaturally today. Maybe today God wants to break some chains. Maybe today he wants to restore some relationships. What would Sundays at New City Church look like if we had a couple of people that walked into church just with this mindset of maybe, just maybe, today is the day revival breaks out. Maybe, just maybe, today he will call us back to a heart of worship. Maybe, just maybe, today he gives us that love for his word. Maybe, just maybe. Chicago looks differently. Maybe, just maybe, the violence begins to stop. Maybe, just maybe, my family's put back together again. Maybe, just maybe, I get that relationship. I don't know where you're at in your life. What I'm trying to do, what I'm attempting to do is build your faith. All I'm saying is give God a chance. If you walk in here with just a maybe, we maybe see some pretty awesome things take place. Why does God do that, though? Allow things to get worse before it gets better. Is he playing with our emotions? Is he just having a laugh? I don't think so, because the Bible tells us that Jesus is sitting on the right hand of the Father interceding for our behalf. He's not laughing at us. It also tells us in Hebrews 4.15... For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. So we serve a God that understands us. Somebody look to your neighbor and say, hey neighbor, he understands where you're at. God has a tendency, there's a pattern throughout scripture and history of God eliminating the natural and logical possibilities someone can point to as being the reason for them receiving their blessing. So he knows they're sick, but he'll wait till they die. He knows that he can't walk and he'll wait a couple of years. He knows they can't see, but he'll just allow them to go through life for some time this way. He'll let it get worse before it gets better. And why is that? Well, the reason is, is because when you receive your miracle, you won't be able to take the credit for it. He's not in the business of sharing his glory. He wants you to know that what he has for you is so special. The only way you get this thing is by divine intervention. I want to encourage somebody in the room that when your situation gets worse, start getting encouraged. When your situation starts to look like it's about to die in a coffin, start celebrating and giving thanks to God because now you know that the doctors can't do nothing about it. Now you know that no family member can do anything about it. Now you know there ain't a person that you can call that can do anything about it. If you know God has put something in your heart, he's made a promise to you, but it doesn't look like it's about to happen, guess what? You're in the perfect position for divine intervention. You're in the perfect position for God to show you his power, show you his dominion, show you his glory. So we're like the Shunammite woman. 
There's these areas in our life that are God-given. God gave you that desire. God gave you that thing. God put that passion in your heart. And then we begin to pray about these things. We begin to wrestle over these things and nothing happens. We get discouraged and, and we do what she does. We, we take this thing and we make our decision about it and we say, it must not be for me. Let me tuck this thing away somewhere. Because the clock is ticking and time is moving on and, and, and nothing is happening. For a second, I, I want you to really lean into this for a second. What are these areas in your life? Holy Spirit, as I'm preaching, I pray you allow this to surface. I'm asking you specifically. I'm not talking to your neighbor. I'm talking to everybody in the room. If you're looking, if you're watching online, I don't know what camera to look at. but, But ask yourself this question this morning. What is this area in your life that this morning the Holy Spirit is not leaving alone? He's just poking at your heart right now. He's reminding you of that thing. What is that thing that you have tucked away somewhere? God put me on an assignment this morning to remind someone there's an area in your life that he's not done with yet. There's an area in your life that he's not, work, he's not done working through yet. There's an area in your life that may seem dead, but that don't mean that he's done. Death is never, it never means that God is done. The evidence of the cross proves that death never has the final word over our situation. So here's what's interesting now with all that context and all that information. Let's get to the main text this morning. The woman I just spoke to you about sounds a little differently than the woman we read about to start this sermon. And that's because that experience she had with the prophet was transformative. The experience gave her a revelation of what God what hope in God looks like despite the situation looking impossible. So by the time we get to our text today, there's a couple of things that we see. We see that this woman experiences a tragic event. She experiences something that she was familiar with in the past, and that's heartbreak. I feel comfortable enough to say that this tragedy, though, was on a whole other level. Because, friends, it's one thing to deeply desire something that seems unattainable, especially when it feels like God gave you that desire. But it's a whole other thing to finally attain it, attain what you've been wanting, attain what you've been craving, attain what you've been desiring, and then seeking God for it and then just lose it. And not just lose it, but then having it die under your care. Verse 20. And when he lifted him up and brought him to his mother, the child sat on her lap till noon and then died. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't imagine the anguish one must feel in a moment like that. And I don't want to just look past this as just a biblical story. This really happened and this really happens. I don't wish this on my worst enemy. But I am grateful that the Bible doesn't shy away from highlighting real tragedy and heartbreak that the people of God go through in their lives. It allows me to understand that we aren't exempt from heartbreak, but God understands my heartbreak and has a purpose for it. There is not a tragedy you can possibly go through that God isn't familiar with. Remember Jesus in John 11 when his friend Lazarus died? Jesus knew he was going to bring him back to life. He knew it wasn't wasn't going to end in death. But that didn't exclude Jesus from experiencing those real emotions that you feel when you lose a friend. John 11, 33 says, When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had, had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid them? They said, Lord, come see, verse 35, Jesus wept. The God that we serve isn't out to get you. The God that we serve understands you. But like the Shunammite woman, he is doing a work in you and has a purpose for all of it. One more time, let's say neighbors say he understands. 
Do me a favor. Look at your neighbor right in the eye and say, he understands. Somebody got to understand that today. Somebody really needs to feel that today. Like I was saying before, though, this version of the Shunammite woman is different. She carried herself differently. She responded differently. The woman we're reading about now isn't a hopeless woman. Although she may be in distress, she is now a hopeful woman, not lacking in pain, but full of hope. The Bible tells us that the son dies on her lap. She walks him over to the bed, lays him down, closes the door behind her. Then she interacts with her husband and says, hey, I'm going to go see the prophet of the Lord. I'm going to go see Elisha. Verse 23, the, the husband replies, why will you go to him today? It's neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, all is well. How can someone that just experienced what she experienced have the audacity to say something like that? Well, that's because with hope, all is well. And it's not delusionment. You can know that everything is not okay, but when you understand who is in control, all is well. I wish I had a couple people in the room that would remind their situation, hey, I don't know what you did. I don't know about this situation being dead. But I do know who's in control. And because he's still in control, I can still have hope. I can still have faith. And I can still give God praise in this place. Because if it's dead, it don't mean he's done. If it's getting bad, it don't mean he's finished. I can still have hope. Because it's all well. It's okay with the Lord. Now, ladies, I don't encourage you to keep these things from your husband. But I do want to highlight the fact. That she doesn't tell her husband that the boy died. Mel, you better never, ever. (laughs) Watch what she says to the servant as well. As she's getting closer to the man of God, Elisha spots her at a distance and says, Hey, there goes the Shunammite woman. Verse 26, he says, Run at once to meet her and say to her, Is all well with you? All well with your husband, all well with the child? And she answered, all is well. Okay, so she kept it from her husband, and now she keeps it from the servant of the Lord. What you have to understand about these two instances of her not revealing what was going on to her husband and the servant uh, Gehazi is that she knew something. She knew that the boy was now dead. She knew now what she didn't know back then, that her situation looked impossible again. But now she knows when no one else can do anything about her situation, why waste the energy and the time on things and people that won't make a difference? I don't need your doubt and I don't need your fears. I just need Jesus. I just need the Lord. I don't need friends that's going to speak doubt into my situation. I don't need friends that are going to encourage the fear inside of me. I don't need friends to point me the other direction. If I'm going to talk to anybody, I hope I got friends that are going to remind me, hey, I could pray for you, but that's who you got to go to. That's the one that's going to get you your miracle. That's the one that's going to get you your blessing. Don't waste time and energy on these things, on these people, on these programs if you haven't sought the Lord first. First, God can use counseling, but seek the Lord first. God uses doctors, but seek the Lord first. God can use community and use people, but guess what? That's out of order if you don't seek the Lord first. I need to seek the Lord. When she sees Elisha, she falls at his feet. Gehazi, not being sensitive to what was happening, went to push her away, and Elisha rebukes him. And then we see Elisha's humanity. Verse 27, he says, Leave her alone, for she's in bitter distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me, and he has not told me what's going on. I like to highlight that because we would be, um, it would be incorrect of us thinking that Gehazi had power outside of God. The prophet didn't know what was going on until God himself would reveal it or the woman herself told them what was going on. Again, she points to the fact 
This points to the fact that without God, Elisha knows nothing. Verse 28, then she says to him, and she, I'm telling you, she must have been Colombian because watch this. She's like, did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say, do not deceive me? In other words, she's telling the prophet, I didn't want to get my hopes up. I didn't even ask for this. And in her saying this, I didn't, uh, and in her saying, did I not say, do not deceive me, it communicates to the prophet that something was wrong. So the prophet sent his servant ahead of him to perform the task. He gives him a staff and instructions, but watch what the Shunammite woman says. Verse 30. As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So then he arose and followed her. In other words, until my boy comes back to life, you're stuck with me. That is the picture. That is a perfect illustration of how God wants us to be dependent on him. God, until I see it. I'm not going to leave you alone. God, until you give me what you put in my heart, I'm not going to stop praying. I will anoint every room in my house. I will pray over every door, every passageway. I will do what I got to do. Whatever I have to do, God, you are stuck with me. It's a posture of hope. It's a posture of faith. With hope, you have the strength to hold on. Now, as we continue to read, we see that the servant of Elisha was not able to do anything. Verse 31, Gehazi went on and, and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was no sound or sign of life. Therefore, he returned to meet him and told them the child has not awakened. Immediately, now Elisha enters the room and sees the boy has died. And he does the right thing. He starts to pray. He stretches himself over the boy. And then at first, the, the body of the boy, the text tells us that it became warm. See, I, I, I love this part of the text because it convicts me. Uh, because this is the part in our, in our situation that, that we would probably stop praying. We'll pray until the situation gets warm and then we'll stop. We'll pray because there, there seems to be good synergy in all of this, but then we'll, we'll stop praying when we see progress. But progress don't mean completion. Just because the boy is getting warm don't mean the boy's alive. See, and I love this because the picture of this is amazing. Elisha gets, he, he probably gets excited. He's, he's, he's over the boy. The, the boy's getting warm. And, and you know that's what? That's a sign of life. But, but, but then he, he walks around and the Bible says he's just, he's just pacing back and forth for a little bit. And then I could imagine he's thinking about the Shunammite woman. And, and, and maybe, just maybe, this thought enters her mind, his mind. And he's probably thinking to himself, hey, I know I just prayed and the body's warm. But that's not what she prayed for. That's not what she was asking for. Uh, she didn't want a, her, her, her boy to be warm. She wanted her boy to be alive. So then he comes back and he starts to pray again. Somebody say pray again. No, no, no. Come on. I need you to really say it. Say pray again. I need, no, 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 say it to yourself, pray again. Pray again, pray again, pray again. Whatever the situation is, and maybe it's gotten warm, pray again. If it still looks dead, pray again. You, got, you haven't gotten a response, pray again. You haven't even asked the first time, begin to pray. Do what you have to do because your prayer request should never be, God, I want my situation to be warm and I'll be content with that. No, 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 your prayer request should be, I want my situation to be alive again. There are parents in the room that are believing for children that have lost the faith. Your prayer request shouldn't be, God, I just pray that they would come to Sunday service. No, no, don't stop there because that means it's getting warm, but that, that's not the prayer. You should say, God, I want you to save their souls again. I need you to do something so miraculous in their life. I'm not going to settle with guilt tripping them to church. I want you to meet them. I want you to have an experience with them. I want to see something dead come alive again and again and again. That's the approach. I don't want warm, I want alive. I don't want good, I want complete.
He goes back and intercedes again. And he asks the Lord again. And then the boy sneezes seven times and he comes back to life. Sneezing seven times would be a sign of completion. God doesn't do things halfway. When God sets out to do something, he's not like us where we work on projects and we get that we get really excited for and then we're like in the middle of the project and then whoop. He's not like that. That's not the God that we serve. When God sets out to accomplish something, consider it done. That's the God that we serve. So Elisha is probably thinking to himself, thank God this boy came to life because this son of my woman would have killed me. Opens the door, gives the son back to the woman. She falls down at his feet. It's a sign of gratitude, a sign of worship. And then she takes her son and she has a family back. Everybody close your eyes for a moment. Just in this, in this atmosphere right here, I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you the question that Elisha the prophet asked this woman in the beginning. What can be done for you? What is it that the Lord can do for you? Who's the person you're believing God for? What's the situation you want to see have life again? We so desperately need the guiding of the Holy Spirit, by the way, because at first someone may look at what the woman of God, oh, the Shunammite woman sets in when she's like, hey, I'm good, as a sign of her being content. Hey, I'll admit that we're living in a generation and a time where contentment is an issue. People can't keep jobs anymore because they're just not content. And, and, and it can be toxic in a way. But this is why we desperately need God because in another sense, being so content with where you're at spiritually may also be a hurdle to what God is actually trying to accomplish in your life. So as I ask you this question today, this morning, what is the area in your life what can the Lord do for you? What are you believing God for? Don't reply and say, I'm good. Like the Shunammite woman did in the beginning. But instead, take a different approach. Begin to ask again. Worship team, would you join me up here? I'm just going to give you a couple minutes right here. You take this moment to do business with God right now. Every eye closed in this place as, a, as just a sign of privacy right now. What do you believe in God for? What were you believing God for and you stopped? What is this area you've tucked away? What is God reminding you of this morning? The Holy Spirit is saying, ask again. Ask again. Ask again. Come on, you don't even need permission. You could, right there where you're sitting right now, it don't got to be a fancy prayer. Ask again. God, I want to see breakthrough. Ask again. God, I want to see revival. Ask again. God, I want, I want her to know Jesus. Ask again. I want, I want him to know Jesus. Ask again. I want her to come back to Jesus. Ask again. What is he tugging at this morning? Just a couple more moments. Holy Spirit, I'm praying you do surgery in this room. Holy Spirit, I pray you build hope again in this room. 
The enemy has gotten a hold of your hope. God, I pray you loosen that grip in the name of Jesus again. I pray you build courage in the room again. I pray you build faith in the room again. I pray you build hope in the room again. God, do what you have to do in the lives of your people again. God, I pray that you move in their hearts, in this room, in this place, virtually in the building, wherever it is that people are listening to this message. I pray you give them the courage to ask again. Team, can you lead us in a chorus or something? Just, just lead us in a song. Can I ask everyone to stand in this place? We're about to be done. I, I, I'm about to close. I feel like today, maybe, just maybe, today will be a transformative day for someone in the room today. I got to tell you, I got to be honest with you. When I was writing this message, you know, as pastors, as preachers, we always seek the Lord. But, but I just, you could ask my wife. I kept saying to her, I was like, I don't know who it is. But I feel like God is literally handwriting this message for someone so specifically this morning. And so I don't want to rush this moment. I want you to have your time with Jesus. I'll come back and I'll close in just a second. But as the team leads us in a chorus, as a sign of worship, of praise, of expectation, of God just building your hope again, of God just building your faith again, can you lift up your hands? Come on, talk to God. It's just you and him. Talk to the Lord. Lead us, team. Come on. with this message you know that the Holy Spirit had you in its sights this morning can I just ask you to raise a hand I just want the opportunity to pray for you if that's you just lift up a hand I see you 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 so many hands I can't even count it I see you I see you God build faith again God build hope again come on just another moment if that's you I see you sister I see you brother I see you sister I see you I see you come on in the balcony I see you I see you I see you sister Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. The enemy can't have my worship. The enemy can't have my faith. He can't have my hope. Come on, let's pray. Father, I thank you for every hand that has gone up this morning, Father God. God, I thank you, God, that you had them in mind, God, when you ministered this word into their hearts, Father God. Lord, I may not be privy to the situation. I may not know all the details, but I do know who's in control, and that is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So, God, I just pray, whatever that desire is that's been God-given, Lord, would you breathe life into that situation, God? God, would you do something so supernatural in that situation, God? For those that are believing for people to come back home, God, would you do it today? Maybe, just maybe, you wanted to move this way, God. God, for those that are praying for healing, God, God, I pray that today be the day that the doctor report looks a lot differently, Father God. Do what you have to do, God, in our midst, in our lives, oh God. Keep that faith alive, God. 
Keep that hope alive, God. Fan it into flame, oh God. Holy Spirit, guide them, lead them. I believe that some of these desires that you're putting in their hearts, they're, they're put there in order to be a blessing to your kingdom, oh God. So we pray, build your kingdom through them, oh God. Jesus' name. One more prayer, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're in the room this morning, I just want you to know something. Elisha was a foreshadow of Jesus. Elisha had to stretch himself out over this boy. And then he had to walk away and then come back and do it again. And then this boy came to life. You fast forward years later, there's a man named Jesus that walks into the scene. And what you read about in the gospel is he'll go up to a little girl that has died and just speak life into her and she just rises up and has life. She'll go, he'll go to his friend's Lazarus tomb after three days of him being dead and he'll just say, Lazarus, come out. And, and Lazarus came out. He'll, he'll go to a little boy's house and he'll say, he'll say, hey, come up alive. And that boy came up alive. In other words, Jesus has the resurrection power that your soul needs and you desperately need him this morning we have fallen short we have sinned against a holy God but God made a way to, for us to have relationship and communion with him again and it is through his son Jesus Christ the one that has all the resurrection power so if that's you and you want to give your life to Jesus this morning can you just lift up a hand and put it down I see you. One, two, three. Come on, if that's you, lift up a hand, put it down. Four, five. Amen. Amen. Church, would you pray this with me? Dear Lord Jesus, I believe. Come on, say it together. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my sin, you took my shame. You took my guilt and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to. Today I turn from my sin to be made new. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen, amen. Church, come on, will you put your hands together? The scriptures say that if even one repents and turns to Jesus, there's a celebration. So come on, can we make some noise? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, God. We thank you, my God. We are so excited. We're so happy that each one of you made it today in the room and online to be a part of this moment of worship and hearing the message that God put on Pastor Joaquin's heart. If you are one of those people who put your beautiful hands up, we want to ask that you would meet us at the Connect Corner in the back. We have a gift for you. Gifts are always good, right? Uh, and we want to pray for you and give you some next steps on how you can be connected here at the Life in New City Church. Um, if it's your first time here, we would love for you to make it to the back as well. We have a gift for you and maybe you came today and something resonated with you maybe you came and you were in need of prayer we have an incredible prayer team their hearts just beat for people and so I ask that you would go to the back and meet that prayer team and simply let them love on you and cover you in prayer before you leave New City I am so glad that you made it I pray your hearts are encouraged and full of hope this Sunday God bless you you are officially dismissed
no matter what it looks like. Set your heart.